really worth that, a dime. A dime? Mm -hmm. Is that what you worth? No, that's what your, your labor is worth. A dime? Mine's worth about $20, $25 an hour. Well, see, he said, uh, <laughs> blind man. Ego man, <laughs> ego, <laughs> ego maniac, <laughs> right. worth a hundred times what you really worth. Yeah, I'm not even worth that. Oh, 9.41. Oh, I'm teasing, I promise. Teach 
495. And the riches of God's saving grace Going down from the cross for me There the debt for my sins by the Savior was paid In his suffering on Calvary Oh, the death of such wonderful love Flowing boundless and full and free And the death Suffering on Calvary. Now my heart humbly bows in his presence today when I think of his agony. By his stripes I am free from the bondage of sin through his suffering on Calvary. All the depth of such wonderful love flowing boundless and full and free. And the death for my sin was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see. By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the death such wonderful love flowing boundless and full and free and the death for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary Almighty God and Heavenly Father glory and honor be to you and to your name you devised the plan before time started to save mankind and not only did you devise the plan Put it, he put it into practice. And the Holy Spirit makes sure it's still truth. We're so grateful, Father, that we have a, a reminder, a memorial every week of the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Please bless the ones partaking tonight, Father, but help us all to remember that we are very fortunate people. Because if we're in Christ, there's no condemnation. That couldn't have happened without his broken body. Forgive us of our sins. Help the ones partaken tonight, Father. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Father, we continue thanks for what's in the cup. Jesus said it was his blood. It is the blood that forgives us. It is the blood by which we are forgiven. It is the blood by which we've been repurchased. It is the blood by which we have a restored relationship with you. Thank you for the memorial. Thank you that we can go back and look at that example. He took that cup. And he said, this is my blood shed for the remission, the forgiveness of your sins. We're a very lucky people, Father, and thank you for it. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. It sweetly cheers my drooping. 
quivering heart in this dark veil of tears. Life to my life it still imparts and quells my rising fears. Holy Book divine, precious treasure mine, lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. This lamp through all the tedious night of the cloak guide my way till I behold the clearer light of an eternal day. Holy Book divine, precious treasure mine, lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. Would you please mark 103? One hundred three. We will use that as a means of encouragement tonight. Turn to Genesis chapter four, please. While you're turning to Genesis chapter four, I want to remind you that Burns Memorial Service is this coming Saturday at Memory Lane, and they are going to have lunch at the building in Silver afterward, and uh, so. I lost a great friend and a great brother, and uh, he's gone on to where I want to be. So I uh, can't feel completely sorry for him, as a matter of fact. And uh, so just keep the Howard family in your prayers. It's, uh, that's uh, two they have lost now out of the six. And uh, kind of like my granny's family, they, they've uh, died in their 60s, and, and uh, it's kind of sad. We live in the land of the free. We live in the greatest country in the world. We have more than most people. We have, we have had so many technological advances, it is unreal. I didn't do that this morning. We have been so privileged to see things that never saw before. And so we, since we live in the land of the free, our forefathers made sure that when they came over here, the, the main reason they came over here was freedom of religion. That is why the first few words of the Constitution, the First Amendment, I should say, has to do with Congress shall not make a law forbidding the expression of religion nor promoting it. Now, they've done a good job on the second. They've done a very poor job on the first. Because I work in a system in which people try to find where separation of church and state is in the Constitution and it isn't there. They even try to find it in the Declaration of Independence. They had me fooled for a while. It's not there. It was from a court case in the 1930s that said that there's a precedent of separation of church and state. I don't have time to go into the history of it. But I assure you, that is not what the forefathers intended whatsoever. They may not have agreed. Even Thomas Jefferson, who was what we would call a deist, that is, he didn't, he didn't believe in organized religion, but he said at the same time, hey, the reason we're here is because of God. And you can't make a law forbidding the expression of religion, and yet I work in a system that tells me that, and they can. In fact, they could fire me if I was, if I was asked by students the, what's about the Bible and what's about this and what's about that and, and I can't answer them without being under the threat of termination. I think it's just sad and it's just disgusting. Yet on the other hand I understand the people who don't want chaplains in, in schools and I understand what, where they're coming from because we fought for years and years one particular the denomination back home, they always tried to dictate their way. In fact, from one of their principals, uh, she always gave church kids that went to her church the preferential treatment. And I was always told that is not the way it's supposed to work. And she didn't really do that until he got to retire. And he told me, he says, you know the way I've seen it. Without getting on a soapbox about that, the question before us is, does worship really matter? Does worship really, really matter? Does it matter what you do? Does it matter what you 
even contemplate? Does it, I mean, can we just make up our own rules? Can we just do our own thing? Well, let's go and talk to Cain. Let's go ask Cain about this. You see, in Genesis chapter 4, God had told them already what he wanted. He wanted the first and the best. Abel was meticulous at this. He went in, he was a keeper of the sheep, and so he went in and he made sure he got the first and the best without spot and blemish, and he sacrificed that. Cain was a tiller of the ground, and it's a mistake we've made in the church that says that because he didn't bring a lamb, Cain was not right. That is not correct. I will argue with you till you're blue in the face. <laughs> That's not what God said. God said, you bring the first and the best, but what happened? He just picked up scraps. He either forgot that he was supposed to do this. He either didn't care that he was supposed to do this. And God had already counseled him earlier. Sin lies at the door, but you should rule over it. And what happens? You know what happens. He goes and starts talking with his brother. And again, I've said it before. I'll just say it again just to just make some people mad. I wish I'd have known what those words were. I wish I'd have known what the conversation was because whatever the conversation was, Cain killed his brother. The second sin in the world. First was lying. And when he killed his brother, he didn't even care apparently because when God asked him, where is your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? And God said, what have you done? What have you done? You don't know this, but I do. The blood of your brother Abel is crying, screaming from the ground. And there's only one person's blood that's greater than Abel's blood. Hebrews 11.4, whose blood is greater than Abel's? Jesus. That's the only one. And so it is that when Cain does this, and when God pronounces his judgment on him, Cain has the audacity to say, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And the Bible describes Cain as just a selfish individual. He only thinks of himself. He corrupts. He is so corrupted that he can't do what's right. That is, he can't take the time to stop and start listening to God. He didn't listen once. And 1 John 3, 12 and Jude 11 says that's the way false teachers are. They go in the way of Cain. They want to be number one. So is worship that important? If Cain were standing here, he'd tell you it's very, very important. Well, let's go ask Moses. You see, in Exodus chapter 3 and 4, Moses has already lived in the land of Midian for 80 years, or for, excuse me, 40 years. He's 80 years old when he sees this incredible sight. And he sees this sight of a bush that is burning, but it's not being consumed. And so he's got to turn aside, much to his wife's chagrin, and see what this is. And he hears the words, Moses, Moses. Moses says, here I am. Take your shoes off the place you stand is holy ground. What you're going to do is you're going to go back to Egypt and you're going to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But he's not going to let you go. But I will be with you. Now what God did not tell him, and this always intrigues me, is God didn't tell him that a new Pharaoh came to power that didn't know Moses. Didn't even know anything Moses did. The problem Moses has is he's always thinking of himself. He's an angry guy. He's not the Charlton Heston that we, we got in Cecil B. DeMille. That lady almost throw something at me one time for that. And, and he's not that guy. And so it is that he's gonna, he's finally 
reluctantly, reluctantly takes the sign of God. You know, if you go through Exodus 3 and 4, you go through the excuses and you go through all of And then he finally says, tell God, get somebody to do it. That ticked God off. So he knew God wasn't going to take no for an answer, but he still wasn't right. Jesus almost took his head off with a sword. The reason was he hadn't sacrificed or circumcised his son. Not sacrificed. Let me re let me emphasize that. He hadn't circumcised his son like he was supposed to. So his wife does it, throws the foreskin at Moses, said, you're a husband of sorrow to me. And so he goes back. God tells him again, tell Pharaoh, let my people go three days journey in the wilderness, but he won't let you go. But I'm going to make sure he does. Well, you get to chapter 5, and what happens? Oh, my. Chapter 5, Moses says, it's just what I told you it was going to be, God. It's exactly what I said was going to happen. He hasn't let them go. I'm not the guy for this job. Get somebody. I mean, come on. God says, oh, now you're ready to see what I'm about to do. You see, Moses wasn't ready for what God called him to do. God says, all I need is your mouth. All I need is you. But you're not, you weren't ready for it. Now you're ready for it. You get over to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. They've already left. They get to Mount Sinai. They get God tells them in Exodus 19, don't you let a, even a donkey touch this mountain lest it be thrust through with an arrow. And Joshua is permitted to be a little lower on Mount Sinai, and Moses goes up for 40 days and receives the commandments. And they know the first three commandments are, you will not have anything or anybody before me. The first three commandments have to do with who's number one, that's God. What happens? He's up there on the mountain, and it's about the 40th day. And all of a sudden, God says, you got to get down. The people have corrupted themselves. Well, Joshua, he's, he's hearing the noise, and he said, it's the sound of war. Moses said, it's not the sound of war. It's the sound of play. You get down there, and what he, what Aaron has done in Exodus 32 is he has done the most disgusting thing you have ever imagined. He has told the people, bring your jewelry, bring your gold, and he folded and fashioned a golden calf. That's not the worst of it. The worst of it is... When Aaron said, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt. When Moses got there, you can imagine the eyes. You can imagine the people. He took those tablets. As I said, he's an angry guy. He took those tablets of stone and he threw them down and he said, who's on the Lord's side? And about 3,000 people that day died. That's the foreshadow of the three, about 3,000 in Acts chapter 2, incidentally. And here he is telling the people, God is still God. What did they do? Uh, they complained. They complained they didn't have water. They complained they didn't have food. And then when they got food, they complained about the food they got. They wanted meat. God said, I'm going to give you so much meat, you don't think it's coming out your nose. That's what God said. That's not a paraphrase. Then they got tired of the meat, and they kept complaining and complaining and complaining. And what Moses didn't see was, is he didn't see what this was doing to him. I have to tell you that if any Bible character and I would get along, it would be Moses. Because you see, what Moses, what people don't notice is, what most people don't notice is, look at the progression that was happening to get up to Numbers chapter 20. Now in Numbers chapter 6, and the reason I have that there, is because the people complained they didn't have water. 
And so God says, what you do is you strike the rock and water will come out. And they had so much water, they fed two million, two and a half million people, plus all their livestock, they had all they wanted. But see the progression that happened in Numbers 20 was, and I'm not excusing Moses' behavior, but there's a lesson in it for us. First problem he had was that people are complaining. You can't make them happy. You can't do anything to make them happy at all. Then second of all, Miriam got leprosy. You see, when he married an Ethiopian woman, they were he and she and Aaron rebelled against Moses. Moses tried to pray for her, and he finally succeeded. And God took that leprosy away. And then Miriam died. His sister died. That's the one who brought his mother to teach him the ways of the Lord. And all of that pulled up. And God, the people were complaining and whining because they didn't have water again. What did God say? Speak to the rock. Moses says, because you didn't hollow me and Aaron in your eyes, he didn't strike the rock once. He struck it twice. Water came out. All they wanted and then some. But God said, because you did not hollow me in your eyes, you will never go into the promised land. There were only two people that left Egypt that went to the promised land. One was Joshua and the other was Caleb. Moses got to see it. Moses' natural vigor, his, his physical, his physique never diminished. And his eyesight never dimmed. But he is the only man that God ever buried. He's buried on Mount Nebo somewhere and nobody knows to this day. You go to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, who does he talk about the most? Moses. Moses. So does worship really matter, Moses? Absolutely. Well, let's ask Aaron about this. I just kind of gave you a sneak preview in Exodus 32 here. Here he is, and he builds that calf and fashions that calf, and then Aaron makes the excuse, well, he, he, won't even, he won't even take responsibility for it. He says, well, you know the people. I told them to bring their gold, bring their jewelry, and when they did, you know what? It was the craziest thing. I've, I'm paraphrasing this a little bit. Do you know it was the craziest thing? When, when it was finally done, somehow a golden calf was formed. He lied. He did that. He acted as though God didn't see any of it. And he did a terrible job teaching his boys. And the reason I know that is, well, why don't we go and ask them? Go to Leviticus chapter 10. Exodus 24 and verse 1. They are told what they are to do. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. They are told what to do. They know what they're supposed to do. They know exactly everything. You go, you go and look at Leviticus 3 and verse 4, Exodus, or Numbers 26, 61. They're always with Moses and Aaron. So they're listening to God, everything about it. But see, I don't know about you, but fire is fire. One fire is going to burn you. If you went to the bonfire Thursday night, you'd have known that to burn you. When I go to the house, if I turn the stove, turn the uh, stove on on top, it's going to burn you. But it's different colors. One is natural gas, and the other is a, just a fire from wood. How about a propane? It's different fire, but it's still going to burn. You. So, doesn't really matter. Well, look at Leviticus chapter 10, verse number 1. They offered. Now, the King James, I believe, is the one that says strange fire. That's not the Hebrew. 
The Hebrew is they offered profane fire. And you see, it really didn't matter. Didn't make any difference whatsoever that they offered it, right? What did God do? I remember the church one time almost wanted to throw something at me because she could not understand Leviticus 10 and verse 1. God killed them. The fire that they offered killed them. God used it to kill them. And then guess who's going to start talking? Guess who's going to almost open his mouth? Their dad. The one that made the golden calf, the one that says, this is the God who brings you out of the land of Egypt. And God said to Moses, you tell him, shut his mouth. I will be regarded as holy. Can you imagine the, the, what they must have seen? Imagine what that must have been like when they offered that profane fire, that vulgar fire to God, and God killed them? Did it really, really matter to Adab and Abihu? Well, let's go have Saul. Go up to 1 Samuel chapter 9. Saul is of the tribe of Benjamin, of the house of Kish. He is amongst the lowest member of our lowest tribe within the 12 tribes of Israel. The house of Kish is the lowest house within the tribe of Benjamin. And Saul's advantage was he was taller than, he was the tallest man in Israel. If he wasn't in the world, he was the tallest man in, in the world. Uh, if, he, if he wasn't in the world, then he was the tallest man in Israel. And so he looked kingly. And so when he was anointed king in 1 Samuel chapter 9, he knew exactly what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to do everything God said to do. But if you've ever studied the Bible long enough, go up to chapter 13, and you know what happens. 1 Samuel 13, he is supposed to do everything God said to do. But you know what I mean? Worship replaces sinning. Worship, you know, you can go to church and that just replaces all your sins from the previous week. That's what some people believe. No, no. That didn't do it. That didn't do it at all. And we get this example of this even in Saul's life. Well, it doesn't really, really matter. If God said that that he's supposed to, that we're supposed to do what he says. It doesn't really matter. And then the second time is the most famous time in 1 Samuel 15. What he does is, is he's told, it is time for God to take his revenge on the people of Amalek. You see, the people of Amalek would not let Moses and the children of Israel cross through their land. It's time for revenge. You go to Amalek and you destroy everything there. Men, women, children, babies. I don't care what it is. God said you destroy it all. You wipe them off the face of the map. So it is. That Saul goes. And Samuel comes in and he goes... And Saul saw him... And he says, oh, I've done what the Lord told me to do. Samuel says, really? What is this bleeding of sheep I hear? And what is this you've even brought back the king? Well, Samuel, Samuel, calm down here. It's not that big of a deal. I'm paraphrasing, but this is what Saul tried to do. What we were going to do is we were going to, we, we destroyed all the bad stuff. We destroyed all the awful stuff. But what we're going to do is we're going to sacrifice, make a sacrifice to God. You see, he made the same mistake in chapter 13. You thought I'd just skip 13, didn't you? 13, he made a sacrifice, something he's never allowed to do, because you see he's of the tribe of Benjamin. 
There's only one tribe allowed to do sacrificing. That's Levi. And so he sinned once. And then when he saw that excuse wouldn't work, he tries another excuse. Well, you know these people, they are stubborn as a herd of mules. They do whatever they want. They didn't listen to anything I said to do. Samuel says, bring the king in here. And so Agag thought that the anger had simmered. And he goes in and Samuel takes a sword and cuts him into pieces. And then tells him, tells Saul, God has cut you from being the king and you will no longer have any descendants who will be king. Saul is like thinking this is so unfair. The spirit of the Lord went away from him. And, Saul, and God says, I am sorry I made Saul king of Israel. And of course, David is his replacement. So let's go and ask David about this. By the time you get to 1 Chronicles 13, you, you, you would think David would have got the message. I mean, he knows, for example, 1 Samuel 24 and 1 Samuel 27, he knows who's the Lord's anointed. He didn't kill Saul. He had the opportunity to kill Saul. He says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. 2 Samuel 1, he turns around and somebody claims that they killed King Saul, so he kills them. And finally he figured out that Saul was killed himself. That's what he did. And so here it is that David is even so gracious to the family of Saul, he finds out that Saul's got a grandson by the name of Mephibosheth. And he treats Mephibosheth just like he's a part of the family. And so by the time you get to 1 Chronicles 13, you've got the entire 70 elders who have appointed him the king of Israel. He was king of Israel, or king of Hebron for seven years, king of, it, of Israel for 33 years. And so he consults with the people. He consults with individuals that it's time to bring the ark of the Lord home. The problem is he doesn't consult whom? God. He doesn't consult God. And so, you got to admit, David tries to do it right. He has a brand new cart made. He has the best oxen. And he hires two individuals, two Israelis, to take that cart and bring it back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem wasn't even part of the nation of Israel until David came along. And so here he is, and he's dancing around. They're playing instruments of music, and they're thinking God is so pleased with all of this. And when Ahio and Uzziah are leading those oxen. The oxen stumble and they almost drop the box, almost drop the Ark of the Covenant. And Uzziah reaches out and touches the Ark of the Covenant to keep it from falling over. What happened to Uzziah? God killed him. Why? Because I will be regarded as holy. David says, you know what? I don't want any part of this. Take it to the house of the Obed-Edom and leave it right there. Can you imagine what Obed-Edom, man, his house was blessed. His house was so blessed. But what was the problem? He didn't consult God. You see, the law said that you have to cover that ark up. You have to take holes and put it through, or put it through the hooks, and the Levites were to carry it. Nobody else, Ohio and Uzziah, were not Levites. And God says, I will be regarded as holy. And so a few years later, David consulted the Lord, and they did exactly what God said to do on another occasion when 
the ark was taken by the Philistines. They knew they better get that back. I mean, tumors were breaking out all over their body, and they said, we got to get this back. They finally put it on, on an a oxen and sent it back to Israel. They didn't even go near it. And the tumor stopped. But you see, Eli let that happen, 1 Samuel. Because the people weren't doing what God said to do. So, out of anybody, you'd think this guy would have known. You'd think this guy would have known that worship is the most important. Doesn't he write one of our memory verses, Psalm 122.1? I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord and worship. But how about let's ask Jesus. Let's ask Jesus. Matthew 4, and I didn't put it in the notes, but Luke chapter 4, verse 8, says the same thing. Here is the devil. He's tempting him in every way that he can. And what did God, what did Jesus say? You'll worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Oh, it was very tempting what he told Jesus. He lied, but it was very tempting. And Jesus, all he had to do was fall down at the feet of Satan to get it. When I hear someone tell me that prayer doesn't work, I refer them to this. Go to Matthew, the 26th chapter. Because you see, I've said the same thing. I've said the same thing in frustration, not getting what I wanted not getting what I thought I should have had, and yet knowing the prayer works. Here's Jesus. And he takes Peter, James, and John with him. And he tells them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And when he go, began to be sorrowful and in deeply distressed, he's almost on the verge of sweating blood. He doesn't do it, but he's on the verge of it. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And so he goes a little farther and he falls on his face and he prays. Oh, my father. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And when he comes back to find the disciples, what are they doing? They're sleeping. They're sleeping. Now, that's easy for us to go point fingers at them, but we're just like them. We miss some of the most significant points in our lives. We miss some of the most significant things spiritually because we don't pay attention. They've been working all day. They've been working feverishly out in that, that get, gathering fish. you got to cut them a little bit of a break because they're tired. But Jesus said, you're missing the point. Verse 40. <clears throat> he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said, Pete said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So again, it goes a second time. And he prayed, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away, and prayed the third time saying the same words. And Jesus got to go see Dr. Phil on television. And Dr. Phil did a documentary all week about Jesus and what the things that he tried to avoid and the things he did avoid. And he didn't go through any of that at all. And, and Dr. Phil prescribed for him some, some psychotic medications. You didn't read that? I didn't either, but I just made it up. But that's what the three disciples thought. No, they didn't know Dr. Phil. And no, they didn't know psychotic medication, but they thought he was nuts. They always thought Jesus was nuts. And here he is, 
and he is sorrowful, exceedingly sorrowful to death. And when he get, he prays the third time, verse 45, he said to his disciples, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the time is at hand. The King, New King James, King James says, Hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayers in it. Now wait a minute. He just got over here. And he's praying because he's exceedingly sorrowful, stressed, stressed to the max. And when by the time you get to the third prayer, he's going, let's get up, let's go. In fact, what does Peter do? Peter cuts Malchus's ear off. Jesus says, put away your sword. He restores Malchus's ear to him. And all of them do what? They abandon him. You remember? Jesus said, you're going to betray me. Oh, no, 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 Peter says, no, 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 no. They will, but I won't. Even if I have to die for you, I won't betray you. And you know what he did. You know what he did. You see, Peter and Judas betrayed him. One repented. One repented. The other didn't. It goes back to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow produces repentance not to be regretted. And when Jesus put the Lord first, he had a very interesting conversation with a woman. He's not even supposed to talk to. Number one, she's a woman, a Samaritan, a Samaritan woman, excuse me. And second of all, she's had five husbands. She's living with somebody in a, in a relationship she's not supposed to be living in. And Jesus says to her, the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. She says, that's the water I want. I don't want to come to this well and <laughs> retrieve that water. Jesus says, you're not, you're not understanding. That's why he says in John 6, 35, I'm the water of life and I'm the bread of life. You thirst, Isaiah 55, 1. You have no money? Come by it anyway. Somebody's already paid the bill. And she says, I perceive you're a prophet. We Samaritans say we're supposed to worship on the mountain. You Jews say we're supposed to worship in Israel, in Jerusalem specifically, sorry. Jesus said, the time is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain, nor will you worship in Jerusalem. But you will worship the Father, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, it's the same God who thought burning flesh and burning hair smelled great. I don't know of anything that smells worse. I think I'd rather smell a skunk than to smell burning flesh burning hair. But God said, that's a sweet-smelling aroma to me. The reason, I don't operate like you do. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So as the heavens are higher, my ways are higher than your ways, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. And so what did he have to do? He had to bring his, or send his son to take care of our problem so we could go home. And the perfect one did exactly what he should have done. You think about it for a while and you wonder, why? Why bother? You know why. Because who he is. L O V E. That's why. L O V E. He is that same father who's just like the prodigal son in Luke 15. He's the same father waiting. He's the same father that stood there, excuse me, I'm sorry, he's the same Savior that stood there when Stephen says, and it's the only place you'll ever read in Scripture, I see Jesus standing at the 
right hand of God. Everywhere else you see him sitting. And it didn't matter that he was making the Jews mad. It didn't matter that he was being stoned to death when he said it. Uh, and then Stephen says something very interesting. I missed this for years. Probably why I emphasize it so much. Stephen says to the Lord as he's dying, Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. Don't, don't account them for this. And I wondered for the longest time why he did that. Who was standing by consenting to his death? Who held the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen to death? Who thought they did God a favor? By the way, we call him the Apostle Paul. And what did he say? I have turned Alexander the coppersmith over to the Lord. Wonder where he learned that. He learned that from Stephen. Stephen learned that from the Lord. His worship does it really, really matter? The answer is 150% yes. Well, I don't think we sound that great. I don't know that we are that, you know, and it doesn't matter what you think. One of my favorite lines from the old professional wrestling was when The Rock would ask the question, what do you think about, and somebody would, would answer it, he, before they got two words out of his mouth, they'd say, it doesn't matter what you think. And that's what God says, it doesn't matter what you think. I want it my way. And when you do it my way, God says, I love it. I accept it. I desire it. Lord, we just try the best we can. That's all I can ask. That's all I can ask. Does worship really matter? The answer is yes. Sigmund, if you're here and we can help you some way in your spiritual walk with the Lord, we're going to sing 103. We're not trying to force anybody into anything. I've been accused of that, but Jesus said it would be. So, chalk that up. We give people the opportunity that if they need to do something and we can help them, we'd love to do it. And that's what we'd love to do as we sing. Come to Jesus, He will save you, though your sins as crimson glow. If you give your heart to Jesus, He will make it white as snow. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today. Come to Jesus, do not tarry, enter in at mercy's gate. Oh, delay Till the morrow, lest thy coming be too late. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today. Come to Jesus, dying sinner, other Savior there. He will share with you His glory when your pilgrimage is done. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today. The last one is not in the book, so you'll have to look at the screen or there's some copies around the I think he knocked the dead of the park. After this song, we'll ask Patrick to miss us some prayer. In the moment he appears and the light from heaven shines, I'll forget all my fears, every pain I'll leave behind. Then I'll sing.